so much for joining us for this episode of the Influencer Activist Toolkit interview series. We're joined today by Ms. Elisa Camahort page who is a speaker, writer, advisor, and entrepreneur. She is formerly the BlogHer co-founder and COO and founding CEO of Cygnus, a Do Big Things initiative. Among so many other things, Elisa is the co-founder and COO of what she describes as a scrappy startup turned global women's media company, BlogHer Incorporated. Through BlogHer's community practices and her own individual practices, she modeled how to build community, how to grow a business, how to support diversity in both words and action, and how to defend transparency and civility as content, community, and commerce collide online. She is a communications expert, especially at translating messaging for disparate audiences. Currently, as an entrepreneurial consultant and coach, she turns strategy into action, ideas into assets, and crossroads into confident pivots. As someone who pioneered integrating an ethos of inclusivity into communities, workplaces, and media, she helps organizations understand the why and the how behind their diversity and inclusion goals. I love what she says in her guiding principle, that innovation and empathy is greater than innovation and efficiency. Welcome, Elisa. Thank you so much, Catherine. I'm so happy to be here. Oh my gosh, I'm so thrilled to be able to interview you. If you are not aware, the months of September and October, the Influencer Activist Toolkit has dedicated to encouraging our community to speak with their audiences about voting, the importance of voting, and how we can use our platforms to make a difference for better change when it comes to the upcoming elections and all elections and how they affect our communities. Um, Ms. Camelhort Page, could you tell us a little bit about your background and platform when it comes to voting? Sure, so and please call me Elisa. Um, so my, I, I like to say that I remember giving my first political uh, soapbox speech when I was in high school, um, when my, uh, I live in California and they were about to pass Prop 13, which was gonna have negative impact on uh, public schools, which I went to, especially, you know, things considered extracurricular like arts programs. And so the students decided to throw a rally and I got up and spoke. I have no, I, I had no memory of what I said or anything. I just remember it happened. So, and then later, um, uh, before I started blog her, uh, I was actually quite involved during the 2004 election cycle. I was the blogger for the local Santa Clara County Democratic Party. I was my assembly district's representative to the California State Party Executive Board. I got super involved at the local level, which was really interesting after following, following pretty much national politics most of my life. Um, but then when we started Block Her, we wanted to be an omnipartisan organization and we wanted to have civil discourse and even civil disagreement across the ideological spectrum. So I found that I had to change the way that I engaged with people, the way I spoke with people. Uh, if I was going to be inviting people on the other side of the spectrum from me to speak at our conference or write for our site, they couldn't exactly, they shouldn't exactly go online and find me being this super rabid rabble rouser partisan hack, right? So I had to find a new way to communicate. And then even after leaving the company that acquired BlogHer in 2017, um, I decided that I, I liked a lot of what that new kind of communication style had helped me do to speak with people and bridge gaps and sometimes find a little opening to change people's minds or open their hearts. Uh, the other thing that happened after I left the company that acquired BlogHer was that I wrote a book and I had been thinking about doing that uh, when I pitched them on letting me kind of gracefully transition away. Uh, but I had been thinking about writing a book about business or leadership or something. Uh, and, and the funny thing is, is I pitched them on this whole idea and plan the week before the November 2016 election. So when the election happened and I discovered we would be living in a different world than I had imagined when I had concocted this plan, um, my plans changed. And I joined up with two other women to write Roadmap for Revolutionaries, Resistance, Activism, and Advocacy for All. But the thing is, there was already, by the time we were writing this book, because it took a few months to get a book deal and get the contract and start writing, 
Um, there were there were already quite a few groups that were focused on Congress and the presidency. In, indivisible is like the one most people know. And so we wanted to focus on other aspects of political activism, ag uh, advocacy over the causes you care about, any of those things. We wanted to like take a different tack and point people in the direction of what they could change a little closer to their own home. Okay. So just before we jump into the meat of this conversation, you use the word omnipolitical. And I automatically question, can omnipolitical and advocacy actually work together? Like, is that a thing? So yeah, omnipartisan, meaning all, <laughs> and omni just means all, right? It means um, across, what we meant by it was across the partisan spectrum. But there are some things that we all care about. And we did a lot of different kind of activism and mission-oriented um, activities with BlogHer. And, you know, not every activity is going to be for every member. And you can just, you can accept that right from the get-go if you're going to run a community that you can't make everybody happy all the time. But there are a lot of things that everybody cares about. Hungry children, you know, everybody cares about that. Everybody cares about um, a lot of times local issues that are really important. And, and uh, so, yes, you can bring people together around issues where there is a common ground to make things better. I always think about the, the gal who ran for state legislature in Virginia, Danica Rome. She's the first openly trans woman who was elected to a state legislature, but the bulk of her campaign was focused on streetlights um, in her town in her area. There was a lot of apparently conflict and drama about this. And so she took a position on it that people liked and they voted for her. And, you know, people care about what's close to home. Okay. Streetlights. That's very interesting. I like, I kind of like the analogy of, you know, running on a <clears throat> platform of streetlights, you know, being a, a cause for us to illuminate the rest of the world. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yes. Um, so this question, what is the point of advocacy and why is there a need, especially in the blogging community, why is there a need for socio-political advocates? So the point of most advocacy or activism, and I, I see them as slightly different, is you are trying to make change in the world and presumably trying to make change that you think will make a better world. Now, there are a lot of components to that. Um, for If you're starting out on a topic, you might need to start by a, raising uh, awareness, like this is even an issue. Who knew? Streetlights, who knew? Um, then you might need to raise educational levels so that people really know kind of the details. You might sometimes have to raise consciousness. Maybe people have never thought about this before. It didn't affect them directly. They don't realize, I think we're going through a huge consciousness raising period right now, um, very similar to the consciousness raising of 40, 50 years ago, um, because I think a lot of people, we can be cynical and say, well, you should have known that um, racism was still alive and well in America, and you should have known um, the different lives that African-American people live in this country. You should have known about the police. You should have known about how there are differences in job and hiring. There are differences in housing. There are differences in education. It, the list goes on, right? But for a lot of people, I think the point of advocacy and activism is to take them where they are and try to bring them, bring them closer to not just knowing about something, awareness, but being interested in doing something about it and moving them towards joining you in activism and advocacy. And um, so sometimes you have to raise their awareness, then you got to raise their consciousness so they feel that empathy and know it's their problem too. Yeah. And then you got to help them go take the next step. Yes, absolutely. Um, my husband and I, um, we are African-American members at a white congregation and the, um, after the death of George Floyd, our minister reached out to us and had us talk about, you know, Black mm -hmm. Lives Matter and what they could do as a congregation. And I remember our minister came back and said that he had a, one of our um, church members who is white had adopted and raised a black son, but had no idea that systemic racism was an issue. And, you know, we were telling our story, but not even considering how it would change and enlighten people around us because 
we none of us really made the connection of, you know, how is my story going to affect the next person who doesn't look like me, or who may not necessarily care about this. So it's really important to, I think, even <clears throat> kind of go out on a limb and say, hey, even if I don't think it's going to affect or impact the next person, I need to bring awareness to this. So I, I really appreciate you saying that. Yeah. And, you know, it reminds me of a friend of mine who has an adopted African-American child and she and her husband are white. And she told me he's a teenager now and um, she told me they had a new neighbor move in behind them basically and that she went over to tell her neighbor that um, about her son and that he was african-american because she was afraid that if they saw him coming home at night uh, let's say he forgot his key or you know she was afraid and i'm not sure when she started out 17 years ago that she was thinking she would have to have those kind of conversations, but she learned that she absolutely did. And, and that you asked me earlier, well, why should someone use their platform for sociopolitical change? Your platform is an asset. It's in your toolkit. If you have spent your time and energy and sometimes money to build your following and your audience, um, then it is something that you have at your disposal to take action with, to do things that you care about. And when I was listing the ways that African-Americans are challenged in this country, it was not just about politics. It was about food. It was about learning. It was about health. It was about housing. All the fundamental needs that we take for granted sometimes in our life. So it's nice to say you're not political or you don't talk about anything political, but every the personal as i think gloria steinem was famous for saying i'll have to go look that up who was famous for saying the personal is political and if it hasn't become political for you think about that for a minute and go wow how lucky i am that that has never become political for me and how can i make it so that it's not political for anyone and if you have an asset at your disposal a tool in your toolkit where you could really raise that consciousness and make that kind of change, why wouldn't you use it? It's, it's something very important that you have to work with. Absolutely. Um, that leads me into my next question. Um, would you advise and how would you advise people to, ad to advocate for a cause that affects them differently um, mm -hmm. than the community for which they're advocating? Oh, that is such a great question because I wake up every day and I'm upset about a lot of things and not all of them are about me <clears throat> specifically, directly. So the first thing I always advise people to do when they figure out, I, I always say triage. You can't, I am upset about 25 different things, but I can't go out and be a leader on 25 different issues. I don't have the capacity. Um, so I have to pick the things that I want to really educate myself about, be really ready with answers and information and ways to help and where I wanna lead. And then I need to figure out who's already working on this. I don't need to reinvent the wheel. And particularly if I care a lot about another community's um, rights and, and welfare, let's, let's say it's whether it's Black Lives Matter, let's say it's the LGBTQ community, um, whichever it is, go find some groups run by the people who are most directly impacted. Go find some groups, um, some Black Lives Matters oriented groups run by black people. Go find an LGBTQ uh, organization run by someone from that community. Let them lead, give them the mic, uplift them, support them. They've probably had their feet in those streets long before you even knew this was a thing. So make sure you're supporting them. I'm not saying like there's also this group standing up for racial justice, which is mostly non-black people trying to educate non-black people or non, maybe it's even non-BIPOC, I'm not sure, people of color um, trying to educate non-people of color. But in any case, that's good too. Like, like, that's great too. And you should probably take it on yourself to talk to people who are like you about the problems and issues of people who aren't like you, you know, and, and take it off the, the backs of other people to do that but also see where you can uplift and support and not try to be a savior and not come in and bogart the, the idea that somebody's probably had and been working steadily on and isn't getting, again, because of systemic issues, isn't getting the attention, isn't getting the press, isn't getting the funding. Like you can, can help without bogarting what should be theirs. When I think about the actual work of being an advocate and the implications that it has for change. 
how do you see that affecting um, conditions and relationships within your circle and within your community? And I say that from a perspective of having friends and family members who don't support the things that you would like to support or don't believe that the issues are fighting you're fighting for are an issue. Like how can we prepare ourselves for that change and still go forward? Yeah, and I know that's a struggle for a lot of people. Uh, I feel very fortunate that my immediate family and my immediate circle, we're all in this bubble together. So I don't have fraught Thanksgiving dinners, for example, but a lot of people do. And I always say, oddly enough, that it reminds me very much of some of the tips I give for media training. So in media training, I often say, never presume to speak for someone else. Speak only for yourself. Because a lot of times they'll ask you questions like, well, these people over here believe X. Why do you think that is? And I would never answer that for a reporter because I would never try to put words in someone else's mouth. So I make sure to speak for myself, to talk about my feelings and my thoughts and my perspective. Mm -hmm. Now, if I want to have a fact-based conversation, I do have facts that are ready. Like I do know things. However, a lot of people are not moved by data. We, we see this around us every day. If data made all the decisions, uh, I can tell you that 98% of venture funding, for example, wouldn't still be going to only all white male founding teams. Like the data support that diverse teams have better outcomes but somehow that doesn't get through, right? So, but, but information is important. Um, but I start by speaking for myself. But the, the other thing that's really important is to listen maybe more than you speak and to ask questions. So I often start by asking people why they feel a certain way. A lot of times people don't know why they feel a certain way. They just heard it. They just, they can't give you a single example. They can't give you a single citation. And I'm like that nerdy person who's like, what's your citation for that piece of information? But it's not, it's not information. It's not a, it's not a fact. It's a belief. Mm -hmm. And so people don't have citations for their beliefs. But so you can ask them why they have that belief. A lot of times I have had it happen on more than one occasion where someone cannot explain to me why they feel a certain way. And it, it surprises them a little bit. Like they've never been asked to explain why. And then they go, well, I don't know. Well, actually, well, I don't remember. I've just always kind of thought that. And then I, I sometimes do say, well, do you think it's possible that um, if you have a certain belief but cannot explain how or why or where it came from, that, that maybe there are sources around you that are influencing you and that it might be propaganda? Like, do you know it's true if you can't explain it? Um, now, you know, I don't expect to convert people. I'm not out here trying to convert people. And I think really that's the fourth thing is I'm not out here trying to convert you. I'm out here to make the case for why I believe the way I believe and where that comes from and hope that I can just t put a little crack in the veneer of someone to hear something different than they've been hearing and to think about it and to feel. And I think the fifth thing is storytelling. Um, which, which folks who are influencers should be really good at, yeah. which is, you know, why do I have to tell the story of my nephew who was in his neighbor, you know, a predominantly white neighborhood near here and a neighbor called the police on him because he was smoking a cigarette, you know, walking home. Uh, so less than a block from home, right? And um, a neighbor called the police, uh, you know, like... What, nothing happened. It's all fine. It's all good. But I think anyone can know that that wouldn't happen to everybody. Right. And, um, and so I, I, you know, pull out your stories, like tell your stories about why um, I tell Elijah McLean's story. Um, uh, he is one of the gentlemen who has been killed by police and just in the last year, there's something about his story, probably because he was a musician and I, I am a musician, probably because he played his violin at the animal shelter, and I've been, I'm a huge animal shelter person, probably because he was both introverted, which I super relate to, and, and a, he might have been autistic on the spectrum, I'm not sure, but I know a lot of, a lot of my friends who have kids, and there's something about his story that I can't tell his story and not get really emotionally 
choked up and, and moved. And that's the story I'm going to tell the people about why something needs to change. His story is, is the illustration. It is the explanation. And when you can bring a story to your, what you think, you know, you can bring the story that makes you feel, you might also, it's another little crack. Yeah. I, um, <clears throat> I would have to add in that my husband, he's, you know, to meet him, he doesn't speak a lot. He's very observant before he, you know, opens his mouth and talks. And, and after, uh, again, after George Floyd, he, you know, opened up and started talking about just his daily routine and the way that our country has transformed, you know, you telling the story of your nephew just walking home, um, you know, that's a trigger for our community because there are so many of our, um, our community members who have been killed for the simple act of walking home or walking right. to the store. And, you know, my husband started talking about how he is, you know, doesn't feel completely safe just walking around our neighborhood when he's, you know, doing his exercise in the morning and how he strategically wears large headphones so that if someone confronts him, they can see he's wearing headphones and that he can't hear them because he doesn't want anyone to think that he's, that they think he's being rude and, you know, become aggressive toward him. And, you know, just all of these different things and, you know, talking about how on his daily walk, people will come outside and, you know, do yard work to see what he's doing and see what he's up to. And, you know, just the simple act of existing. And, you know, when he started opening up and telling, you know, his story, you know, people were, well, he can come walk in my neighborhood and he's always welcome here. And it's like, it's not just you, you know, my yeah. husband, you can invite him to your neighborhood, but your neighbors don't know him. And they're the right. ones that are, that could potentially put his life in danger. So, right. you know, like you said, kind of opening that crack to let people know, even those who love you and accept you, let them know that, hey, this is bigger than just you and I. Correct. The people in your circle have a part to play in this as well. And then you can talk to that. You know, we can talk to the people in our circle. I always say to women, particularly, women know what it's like to walk in the world as a woman, no matter you know, it, it may be a little worse, a little better, depending on your race or ethnicity, or whether you wear religious, particular religious garb or not, or whatever. But in general, if you're a woman walking in the world, you know what it's like to adjust your behavior because you're scared of an outcome. You know what it's like. And no man, again, regardless of ethnicity or race or religious garb, is going to have the extreme uh, kind of feeling of that um, that, that women will have, you know, the whole carry keys between your fingers. I still, I really do wonder like, would that do anything to anybody, but whatever. Um, the, the whole thing about, you know, not wanting to walk, not wanting to park where it's away from a light or away from the egress, you know, all these things we think about to be safe. And you also, women know when someone is treating them in a diminishing or patronizing way because of sexism. We know when we're being taken, not for granted, but um, you know, taken for less than we are because we're a woman, you know it. You know sexism when you, when you feel it. And so I urge non-women of color to believe the people of color in their life when they say they know racism when they feel it, yeah. when they know that someone's behaving a certain way because of their race or ethnicity. It's the same. You know it when it happens to you and they know it when it happens to them and trust that. You want people to trust you, trust that. And, um, and I think that also sometimes is a tactic I'll take, which is to talk to people about, you know, what has happened to them, whoever, almost, you know, almost anyone who isn't like the prototypical privileged person has had something happen to them because of their identity. And they know that's why, and they can talk, they can tell that story. Well, you know, and as if, you know, racism wasn't a fight enough, you know, it's, we still have to fight for you to believe that it is a thing before we can even start addressing what the thing is. And um, it always just really rubbed me the wrong way that on both sides of the, the coin, someone would say, why are you always playing the race card? And then on the other side of that, knowing that it's an issue because of race, 
but being um, too afraid or feeling the oppression that you can't even acknowledge that it's an issue that's happening because of race, because they don't believe it's a thing. Um, it's so interesting that my little my little neighborhood of San Jose, which is made up of lots of different little neighborhoods with their own little, you know, um, we have a little main street. It's not called main street, but it's essentially a main street, you know, and it's probably less than a mile long. And um, and there has been every day since the George Floyd uh, murder, uh, a little demonstration at the main main corner of our main street. Now, I have to admit, since the skies have gotten so smoky, I have not gone out there. So I haven't been out there in a while and I don't, I think people probably adjusted, but, um, and sometimes it would just be one or two people. And sometimes it would be 15 or 20 people, but this is not downtown San Jose and this is not Oakland, Berkeley or San Francisco. This is like a neighborhood. Um, and one of the gals who's sort of the, one of the spearheading organizers of it, she has this great answer because the one thing I will say is most people drive by and they honk and they support you and they like thumbs up and, um, it's pretty positive, but you always get a few. And one of the most common responses you'll get is, because uh, uh, oh, my sign that I always hold <clears throat> is that one. That's my sign that I that I bring. Um, and most of the signs have some f- form of Black Lives Matter. And you'll get the All Lives Matter. And this this gal who's one of the organizers has this great response that you can yell at a car as it's driving by, which is that's the goal. It's not the reality. That is totally the goal. Like, yes, indeed, so they should. So why don't we do this so they can, you know, like, and and I thought it was a really elegant turn of phrase that I have now stolen used for myself. I love it so much. (laughs) Um, I want to swing back to um, specifically talking about uh, content creators for just a moment and ask this question, how important is it that um, the brands that content creators work with are aligned with their beliefs and support the causes that they champion? So this is a question that comes up a lot. Uh, Before Blogger, I was a consultant. I'm a consultant now, so I work with different clients. And when I was a consultant before Blogger, I was also doing the political blogging that was clearly partisan. And so I've had people say to me forever, aren't you afraid you will alienate half your potential client base Um, by being so explicit with your political views. Now, first of all, I don't think it's a 50-50 country, really. I think it's closer to 60-40, maybe 65-35, and that more people agree with me than don't. That's that's what the data tell me. Um, But second of all, I should be so lucky as to just have my pick of 100% of clients. Like, nobody does, right? And so if... Why would I focus on the percentage of clients I'm not going to get who I not only don't agree with me, I don't agree with them. We're not aligned. And and if they wouldn't want to work with me on the things I do because of my political beliefs, we're probably better off. Instead, I could focus on marketing to and trying to get clients who are aligned with me and who find what I do galvanizing and inspiring. And, and I, I look at like Penzi's Spices. I don't know if you've heard of this brand, but their business has ballooned because the head of Penzi's decided to speak from his heart about his views. Uh, one, of the, one of the people who contributed to the foreword of our book is Guy Kawasaki, who's super famous in Silicon Valley as an, you know, he was Apple's original evangelist for the Mac. He's an investor, entrepreneur, um, you know, author, podcaster. And he told me a story that he then contributed for our forward about, he went to Germany. Um, I can't remember if it was right before the election or right after. And he was talking to some young folks whose grandparents were probably alive and young adults during um, World War II. Mm -hmm. And they said something about, you know, wanting to be able to ask their grandparents what they did during that time period in Germany. Did I say it was in Germany? He went to Germany. Um, and it struck him really hard. And he thought, what, what, are my grand, what am I going to say when I have grandchildren and they ask me what I did? And so he has been using all of his social platforms to be extremely political. And yeah, some people are super mad at him and disagree with him. And of course, they don't unfollow him. They like to hate follow him. But um, <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure some do unfollow him. But on the other hand, he's, his followings have only grown. 
-hmm. And it's because people give him props for being um, authentic and explicit and out loud with what he believes and what his values are. And those are the folks I want to work with anyway. I know it's hard when you're a small business and you feel like you can't pick and choose, but somewhere in you, you are picking and choosing. You know, you're picking and choosing about something. You know, you have to ask yourself, what's the line? Would you not work with an alcohol sponsor? Would you not work with a tobacco sponsor? Would you not work with, name name it, you know, would you not work with someone who had, you know, um, you know, a Jeffrey Epstein person type person who have lines you draw? So you, you get to decide. Um, and I think it's kind of a myth to say, if you decide to draw your lines based on your greater socio-political value set that you're going to lose half your potential client base. I think that's a complete, that's, that's a lie we tell ourselves because we're afraid. Yeah. Or uh, it's much easier to stay safe and comfortable than it is to, to stand up and, and fight. I, you know, but I think our, our, that's if you define safety and comfort in only one particular way, Mm -hmm. but I, I don't find it safe or comfortable when I feel agonized about something, but silence myself from talking about it and feel like I'm doing nothing. I, you know, you know, if you're not upset about how things are, then that's great. Talk about that. If you like, if you're, everything's hunky dory for you. All right. But I know a lot of people for whom they do not think it's hunky dory and yet they hold themselves back. They hold themselves silent. They constrain and restrain themselves. And I don't find that safe or comfortable. Uh, I find that very uncomfortable to do that. Yes. um, I'll say for those of us, i.e. myself, um, you know, who (laughs) who are afraid to, uh, had previously been afraid to say anything for fear of, you know, rocking the boat or causing, you know, discomfort in our relationships. It, you know, it, it, at some point kind of starts to eat you from the inside because you know that there's something that needs to be said. And that's where, because me as a black woman in the South who grew up in the military with a military family, I've always had friends of all different races and ethnicities. And I have a lot, a lot, a lot of white friends. And I always was so afraid to speak up for the things that affected me and my community because I didn't want to hurt their feelings or make them feel uncomfortable. And, you know, within the last, I want to say probably since March, like the switch just flipped for me. And it was like, you know, I cannot afford to be silent about this anymore because I have my husband who this affects. I have brothers, I have nieces and nephews. There are all these people that if I set the example that it's okay to just bear this silently and hope for the best, you know, that's the legacy that I'm going to leave for them, that you don't have to say anything. You just hope that somebody makes it better for you. And, you know, you take no responsibility for that. Oh, that, that is um, so very true. And I also think that, you know what, not everyone who you think is your friend is the kind of friend you want. If you can share your truth and reality and this makes them, it hurts them, their feelings too much and makes them too uncomfortable, then why do you want to have a friend like that? Now, listen, I have lots of acquaintances and colleagues and, you know, I have lots of folks with whom I don't delve very deep and we just sort of, that's fine. But like a friend, Mm -hmm. a friend should know the reality of your life and be willing to take it. I also tell white people sometimes that um, not everything's about or for you. If, if a shoe doesn't fit, don't put it on. Like if you're really, if you hear someone, you know, I know, I know how it must feel. There are a lot, I follow a lot, a lot, a lot of really great um, and, and uh, super incisive and, and spunky and, and like provocative African-American, particularly women. I follow way more women. Um, and, you know, and they say stuff about, you know, white people all the time. Right. And Listen, if we can't by now say not all white people to ourselves or not all whatever, if you can't know yourself Mm -hmm. and that it doesn't apply to you, then you need to sit with that too, right? You don't need to say it to them. Like, I don't need to say to anybody, well, I'm not like that. I did this or that or the other thing. I know what I did. She didn't, she wasn't talking to me. She didn't know me. 
I don't have to convince her who I am. I have to convince myself who I am. And so I, it may be funny to say it, but five years ago, I interviewed Gwyneth Paltrow at Blog Her. And I, you know, I mean, the, the ostensibly it was because she was running Goop and as a media company and we had a whole bunch of influencers out in the audience and talking about growing her brand and stuff. And, um, but that wasn't really a very inter- that wasn't really the very interesting part of the interview, if I may be so frank. Um, what got really more interesting was when we started to talk about when her dad died and when her marriage broke up and the fact that she's a ton of innovators and how, and I would just die if uh, I got a take, I had a tweet that earlier this year that went inc- the biggest tweet I've ever had. I, I, it was a retweet I spent, it was like eight words long. And for some reason it went crazy. Like we're talking quarter of a million retweets or likes. Um, and there were nasty, nasty people responding. And I was like, I couldn't imagine doing this every day. Right. So I asked her about how she deals with trolls and haters. And she said, well, uh, the first thing is that if something really stings, then I have to sit with myself and ask why I let that in to hurt me and where, where the truth is basically in that. Um, and I never thought I would like have an enduring piece of life advice from Gwyneth. Um, but that is one I just sort of remind myself often if I'm stung, uh, you know, it's like hit dogs holler, right? It's that. Um, so, uh, you know, I got to think about that. And that's what, that's what we should all do before we get ready to defend ourselves, our, our, our identity group or anything is just be like, why do I even think this is for me? Like what, what, what's in me that responds to this and raises its hand and say, oh, you must be talking about me. Um, it's, it's okay to just walk on by, you know, you don't have to comment. You don't have to even take it in. Um, but hit dogs holler. If it, if it stings, you got to sit with yourself and figure out why. Let me go ahead and throw an amen on that one. Cause I feel like <laughs> <I'm just saying. laughs> um, as we kind of wrap this up, I want to talk about the big thing. Um, you campaigned for former secretary of state, Hillary Clinton, when she ran for president in 2016. So as we kind of close out, can you tell us briefly about the work that you did um, the lessons that you learned from that experience and any advice that you would want to give to content creators as they get into, you know, the socio-political arena um, mm-hmm. the next, the next few months coming up. Well, yeah, again, my first thing is always to pick a few, a couple of things you're going to really focus on and learn about and become an expert in and all of that. Like you don't have to boil the ocean. I was not on Hillary Clinton's campaign. I was just a passionate individual like evangelist. But the thing I learned is that early in the campaign, because of the primary, I was getting way more negative blowback and bullshit, if, if I may say that, um, from the left uh, from people who supposedly agreed with me on most things than I was getting from like Trump fans or, I mean, I, I may not be followed by that many real right-wing people anymore. Like they've probably had their fill of me, um, which I have accepted and is okay. Uh, so I was getting all this, um, this kind of blowback and negativity and complaint. And so I got into this habit and I think a lot of other women did too, which is I was in a lot of private groups where everybody was like, rah, 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 and, and super passionate and impassioned and positive. But in public, um, I would always take this really even keel, middle of the road. I totally see where you're coming from. I get it. I get it. But you know, here's the alternative. And people are doing the exact same thing now with Biden, which is that I see a lot of people saying, well, the alternative is Trump. But that's not inspiring enough, right? That, that to not being Trump is, is motivating a lot for a lot of people, but it's not motivating for everybody, probably because they haven't been directly touched by some of his policies right now, right? <laughs> so I decided I'm going to reject this habit I had of doing private praise and public critique, and I'm going to just be all about public praise. And if there's any critique, it will only happen privately. And I'm just going to be really super optimistic and positive about it because I can't wait to vote 
for the people that I'm going to vote for and see that change come. And I feel that there's a second thing that's happening. And if it's happening to any of you, be honest and think about this. I think a lot of people were so taken aback by 2016 that they have this fear of being so surprised again. And they feel like, oh, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. So there's this kind of jaded cynicism running through a lot of people in the progressive sphere, which is like, oh, well, you know, he's probably going to, he's going to win it or he's going to rig it or he's going to steal it or he's going to this or he's going to that. But, oh, just prepare yourself. And I'm like, no, no way. I'm not preparing myself for that at all all rebuke that like no um i believe there i believe that that the outcome i want um is the outcome that can happen but i have to be part of working for it and and the thing is you may know that you're going to vote come hell or high water you know how great you are about voting but think about all the for influencers especially think about all the people you talk to think about how much we struggle with turnout rate in this country think about all the obstacles that many people have to overcome especially black and brown people around voter suppression and voter restriction i do not want to contribute to that with what i call voter depression which is to just make people feel like, what's the use? And you know what? That was the 2016 Russian disinformation campaign. A big portion of it was targeting African-Americans not to get them to vote for Trump, but to get them to not vote at all. Because they don't have to repress or, or suppress you if you, they depress you and you stay home. So I, I, re, I re reject the cynicism and jadedness. I'm like, yeah, it's going to take some work, but the numbers are there. The outcome I want can happen that's what I'm going to fight for. And that's what I'm going to say I'm excited about every single day. Um, because I think people are more motivated by positive excitement than negative, um, at least people who would tend to vote on the progressive side. Mm -hmm. And there's a bunch of, there's actually a bunch of research about this, about who is fear motivated versus who is opportunity motivated and how they fall into political parties and stuff. This is really interesting, but that's a whole other long sociological conversation. So, so really that's what I'm about right now, which is I'm, I'm signing up to text bank, donating my money and I'm talking online. And that's the other thing. You have many different ways you can contribute, contribute any of the different ways you can think of. If you don't like talking on the phone, which I do not, that's why I signed up for text banking. Like there are options out there. There are ways to participate, get those lawn signs, get those, like do what you got to do for what you believe you know, don't, don't kick yourself later saying, oh, should I have, should I have done more? Should I have said more? Should I have yeah. um, offered more to people who are wondering what I was thinking about it? No one's going to wonder what I think about it. I love it. Elisa Camelcourt Page, this has been an incredible conversation. I cannot thank you enough for taking time to chat with us, to motivate us and encourage us to stand up and advocate for ourselves and for others and to go out and do great things in the world. If you wouldn't mind, please let everyone know where they can find you um, on social media. Tell them about your book um, and incredible, incredible work. So uh, you can find me at alisacp.com. That's my website, which has links to all the places you can buy my book and my podcast, the op-ed page with Alisa Camelhart page. I'm at Alisa C on Twitter. I'm at Alisa CP on Instagram. And most of my posts on Facebook are totally public. So that's where I talk about politics a lot. This is my book, Roadmap for Revolutionaries. It's a handy dandy size. You can just throw it in your bag. If you're going to protests, the whole first chapter is just about protests and civil disobedience. So what to do if you get arrested? What to do if you get tear gassed? Why protests matter? So it's very relevant for these times. And, and there's all sorts of stuff um, that's not just about, only one chapter is about government and voting and local, you know, there's a chapter about economic pressure. I, I always say how I spend my money is my vote every single day. I vote with every dollar. So there's just all sorts of ways to, to differentiate and, and diversify how you think about what activism and advocacy means. It means a lot of different things, at least some of which any of you could do. Awesome. Thank you again. I and motivated to get up and go turn the world upside down. That could be my Hamilton calling, but I'm going- Don't throw away your shot. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you again for being with us. And I hope you have an incredible, incredible day. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. You too.